Welcome to the ClientWise December 2015 Update Seminar. My name is Lee Ream Sr. I'm an enrolled agent and I've been in the tax business for over 40 years and I'm the co-founder of um, ClientWise and uh, the chief technical officer for the firm. And I also do presentations in the fall at our, at our ClientWise Fall Seminar Updates. Today we're going to talk about the changes that have happened during December. Uh, uh, they may not, may not seem, seem like a lot, but, but when you put them all together, it's quite a few. So, uh, so for, before we start, um, this course is qualified for one hour of, of CPE credit. And uh, to ensure your attendance throughout the entire presentation, we'll be presenting some answers to some polling questions, which you'll need to write down as you go through. So have a pencil ready and be ready to go with that. Uh, when you, when, and they'll, they'll appear on the screen periodically. And you'll take those and you'll go to our website and you'll be able to answer those questions on our, on our CPA Center and instantly generate a CPA certificate. Okay, now we'll also have with this course a, a pretty large, actually it's 13 page PDF document that, uh, that has a lot of details and material we're going to cover. And uh, hopefully you have downloaded that so you can follow us through the presentation. If you have questions during the during the presentation or even afterwards, you can uh, send them to cpe at clientwise.com and, and one of our subject matter experts will respond to your questions as soon as possible. Uh, if you'll turn to the table of contents, which is actually page two of the handout, uh, you'll see what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about the de minimis expense safe harbor that got increased from $500 to $2,500. We're also going to take a look at a uh, premium tax credit estimation worksheet that uh, I put together so you can uh, assist your clients preparing their um, household income for the marketplace so they can get their premium tax credit or advanced premium tax credit correct. Uh, we're also going to talk about the ACA final regulations that that finalize a number of issues covered under the prior guidance. Uh, we're also going to cover the estimates for 2016 auto and truck cents per mile and fleet average uh, fair market value uh, maximums. Uh, we're going to talk about an interesting court case for a doctor's business deduction for a mobile uh, uh, home office was uh, limited. And we're going to look at the IRS uh, relaxes some requirements and proposed uh, regulations for ABLE accounts. And we're also going to talk about if you're an enrolled agent, you better get your renewal done what, when, when you're required to do so. We'll look at the P10 renewal requirements for all these that haven't renewed your P10 yet. And we've got some uh, discussion for CTAC register preparers about their registration and what would happen if they don't register by, by January 15th. Uh, we're also going to look at the, uh, the homeowner's assistant payments. Uh, I, the IRS extended the treatment of those through 2017. And also the IRS issued proposed regulations amending the returns on bona fide residency in U.S. territories, which gives a little more leeway. And we're going to look at the new uh, W-2 verification codes for filing season 2016. Uh, should be interesting. They're going to try to... Uh, uh, try out a system that will eliminate some of the fraudulent activities. We're going to look at my RA accounts. Uh, funding options have been expanded. And we're also going to look at when uh, employees' health insurance premium payments under uh, a spouse's group plan are excludable. And we're going to look at the state daycare payments to a public assistance recipient and, and their determination that they are subject to levy. And then the transportation bill, which got signed in law not too long ago, includes some uh, provisions that we're going to look at. Passport denial for delinquent taxpayers, the rules mandating IRS use of private debt collectors, and the form series 5500 automatic extensions have been re reduced in time. So let's uh, now turn to page three of the handout, and we'll take a look at the uh, de minimis expense safe harbor. Now, as you know, these new regulations became effective in 2014. So this is the, uh, uh, the capitalization repair regs. Uh, been a lot of talk about these and, and uh, 
So let's take a quick look at uh, what this change uh, brought about with, with notice 2015-82. Uh, during the, during our fall seminar, we were obviously teaching how to how to treat this and how to how to prepare for it. And at the time, it was five hundred dollars, and the IRS has to increase it to twenty five hundred. So, under the tangible property regulations, uh, there's several simplifying provisions that were effective uh, and prospective in application, and are intended to ease taxpayers' compliance with these regulations and reduce administrative burden. Now, back in the old days, we used to say to ourselves, well, if something costs $100, we can expense it. Or some people would say, oh, if it costs $200, you can expense it. And some would say, well, oh, $500, you can expense it. And usually the IRS auditor would never you know, blink an eye at that. However, there was never a de minimis safe harbor included in the tax code. This, these new regs actually bring them into play for the first time ever. So... So anyway, one of the simplifying provisions that were included in the regs was, was a de minimis safe harbor election that permits taxpayers not to capitalize, but instead treat as material supplies under Section 162 certain amounts paid for tangible property that acquires, it acquires or produces during the tangible year. Uh, the original regulations allowed a small taxpayer, those without an applicable financial statement, to expense materials and supplies, uh, to, to expense materials and supplies, tangible property does not exceed 500 per invoice or per item on a substantiated invoice. Under notice 2015-82, the 500 amount has been increased to $2,500. The IRS did this primarily in response to uh, stock stakeholders' uh, suggestions that, that the $500 amount was too low. Now remember, you know, this isn't just just an automatic thing. You actually have to have an accounting policy in place and elect to use it. So we have reproduced in your handout an accounting policy that you can use and you'll see there's a spot for line number one, costing, and I left that number blank. It's not always $2,500. It can be anything from one to $2,500. So you have to specify what that is. And it's not always in the taxpayer's best interest to have the full $2,500 there. Might be a small business and you may not want to write everything off at one time. So you might want, you might want to make that less than $2,500 maximum. But at any rate, you have to have this accounting policy uh, completed and, uh, and put in the amount you want to, uh, to use as the de minimis amount, not to exceed $2,500. And of course, have it signed by the owner of the officer and dated. Uh, now, if if a firm and only generally the very large firms like Ford and General Motors and people like that have applicable financial statements, they have to meet SEC requirements and go through all that these financial statements. So, if they do, if a firm does have an applicable financial statement, that expense amount, that twenty five hundred dollar limitation, moves up to five thousand. However, I doubt that anybody taking this class will have that type of, uh, of people. Uh, now, there's one other issue. Everybody has a county tax assessor, and every county tax assessor wants to assess tax on tangible property used in the business. So now, if you're expensing it for federal purposes under the safe harbor rule, that doesn't mean that you get out of the property tax limitations for the state. So you need to check with the jurisdiction and see what their position is on, on this de minimis safe harbor rule and possibly keep separate records for that personal property tax record. Uh, okay, now also the de minimis safe harbor does not limit a taxpayer's ability to deduct otherwise deductible uh, uh, repair and maintenance costs that exceed the amount subject to the safe harbor. Safe Harbor Amount merely establishes a minimum threshold below which all qualifying amounts are considered deductible. Consistent with long-standing federal income tax rules, the taxpayer may continue to deduct all otherwise deductible repair and maintenance costs regardless of amount. So anyway, look that over. Um, make sure your clients all have that policy, that policy in place and uh, elect to apply that policy uh, before the year starts. 
Okay, now let's take a look at the, uh, the next issue up for today, and that's uh, applying on the marketplace. Your, your clients have to, those clients that qualify for uh, insurance through the government marketplaces, the state and the federal, have to input their income in order for the marketplace to determine what their advanced premium tax credit is. And this is where they all go wrong, okay? And so what I've done is I've, I've put together a worksheet that you can use to work with your clients to help them get the right household income into the system. So what is household income? Well, it's a modified income, a modified AGI of all family members required to file a tax return. All right, now who's required to file a tax return? Well, if it's a child in the family, and the child makes $3,000 working at McDonald's, does the child require to file? No. child may file in order to get their refund with their, their money, but, but actually uh, they're not required to file. So therefore, you would not have to include that child's uh, AG, modified AGI in the household income. However, on the flip side of that, if that child made more than the standard deduction, then the child would be required to file. And in that case, the, the, the child's modified AGI would go into the household income. In addition to that, that has some other negative prospects here too, because if the child happened to be receiving Social Security and they are required to file, even though Social Security isn't taxable on the child's tax return, that would have to be added to the house, to the, to the child's modified AGI, which in turn goes to, gets added to the household income. So there are some interesting uh, problems associated with that. Also, modified AGI is the, is the regular AGI plus tax-free interest plus Section 911, that's a foreign income exclusion, and the non-taxable Social Security. So there's some, there's some interesting issues that come, come through that. So now, the, the full worksheet, Actually, I have a, a, uh, a modified uh, worksheet, just a picture of it in the handout, uh, if you'll turn to the next page four. Uh, but the full worksheet is at the end of the, uh, of the PDF file, and that's actually in a form that you can take and use right away, and it has all the numbers and, and tables and stuff you need to generate the, the numbers. And, and by the way, this, this is a significant problem, too, because... H&R Block last year reported that of all the returns that they did, the average amount of addition of advanced premium tax credits that had to be repaid was $700, whereas the people who uh, who overestimated their income got a, get an additional $300 refund. So it, it is a it is a it is an issue, and it can be a problem for low income taxpayers. So if you want to look at that worksheet on page four. You'll, you'll see where I so part one generates the modified AGI for the for the spouse and file a refi, and, and for the taxpayer and spouse if filing jointly, and then part two is for the dependents modified AGI, but this is only for dependents who are required to file, right? So we, we backed out the uh, the standard deduction there, and then uh, you. So let's, let's go on now. So, and then, so then if you have multiple children, they would have to then uh, repeat part two for each one of them and take the sum of those. And then part three is, is the sum of the household income. Part four generates the poverty level that, that the taxpayer is in, which you have to go use to the applicable table to figure out what part of the insurance they have to pay themselves. And of course, the difference is the, the premium, premium tax credit or the advance credit is the difference between the silver cost of the second lowest silver insurance and what the IRS deems that they have to pay themselves. So anyway, um, take a look at that, uh, see if it might be an advantage for you and your clients to help them with it, and, uh, and it might be a big benefit. Okay, let's move on to the next issue. Oh, which happens to be polling question number one. So the answer to polling question number one is San Diego, and you will need to write that down so you can uh, 
answer that question when you go to get your CPE certificate. Got it? Okay, we're going to move on. Okay, and the next thing we're going to talk about is on page 5 is the ACA final regulations, which finalize a number of issues covered in prior guidance. And one of those, the first issue we're going to look at is the grandfather plans. So, under the final regulations, plans existing as of March 23, 2010 aren't required to comply with certain ACA provisions. And the final uh, regulations adopt supplement amendments that permit certain changes in policies without loss of grandfather status. However, on the realistic side, there are slim to none grandfathered plans that qualify. Most all insurance companies drop the other ones and, and put in policies that comply. So it's going to be rare to run across one of those. The next one is the pre-existing conditions exclusions. So... Uh, the ACA provides that group health plan and group health insurance issuers offering group health insurance coverage may not impose any pre-existing conditions uh, exclusions. So those those rules that was adopted without uh, without change. So and that's uh, good for people with pre pre-existing conditions. A lifetime and annual limits prohibition. The ACA generally prohibits annual and lifetime dollar limits on essential health care benefits. Uh, that, that was adopted as well. Prohibition on rescissions. The AC, ACA provides that group health plan or health insurance issuer offering group or individual health coverage must not rescind coverage unless a covered individual commits fraud or makes an intentional misrepresentation of material facts. Now that ex there is an exception and that's, that's the prohibition for rescission for failing to timely pay premiums or contributions towards a cost of coverage, a cost of coverage that includes failure to timely pay required premiums towards a cost of COBRA. So if they don't pay their premiums or they don't pay their COBRA premiums, uh, that's an out for the insurance company to, to, uh, to uh, rescind the coverage. Uh, coverage for dependents under age 26, the AC provide, ACA provides that a group health plan or a health insurance insurer covering a group health insurance coverage that makes a available dependent coverage to children must make that same coverage available to children until age 26. So they can't, they can't, re, they can't say they're going to provide uh, children, dependent coverage for children up to age 24 or 21. They have to go to, they have to up to uh, age 26. Okay, let's move to the, the next issue, which is on also on page starts on page five, and that's the uh, 2016 cents per mile. Now, th these are estimated amounts that one of the major uh, um, technical services provided, and we're going to look at the cents per mile and the uh, fleet average annual uh, lease value. So the maximum fair market values applied to those. So, so. If if a, if an employee provides personal, if an employee gets personal use of employer's provided auto, that is treated as a Finch benefit, and valued using one of several methods. One of the permissible methods is allows the employer to value personal use under the standard mileage allowance rate. For 2016, that hasn't been released yet. It's due any day. This is this is December 10th, and it was supposed to be out today, but uh, it has not seen it so far. Anyway, the 2015 rate was 57.5 cents per mile, and we could expect a significant drop in the in that rate for 2016 because of the uh, lower gas prices. However, under this method of value, the employer provided auto exceeds uh, exceeds the total number of miles that dro drove it for personal purposes in the tax year times the standard mileage rate. However, this method may not be used. Only if the auto's fair market value does not exceed fifteen thousand nine hundred, down from sixteen thousand in two thousand fifteen, or if the vehicle is a truck or van, seventeen thousand seven hundred, up from the seventeen five in two thousand and fifteen. Now, as an alternative, an employer can use the uh, table value method. That's the fringe benefit value of the employee's personal use of a company-provided auto. It's found in regulations. Uh, noted there in the text. However, that same table is in the big book of taxes if you already have that. So the employer determines the fair market value of the auto, 
finds a dollar range for the table that it corresponds to the fair market value and multiplies the annual lease value shown in the table for that fair, that fair market value by the ratio of the employee's annual personal mileage uh, of the annual total mileage, uh, employee connected business and driving, and that's a proration, and that's, uh, that'll be the amount that's added in. Where an employer with a fleet of 20 or more autos may determine the, fair, the uh, ALV for each auto in the fleet if all of its fair market values are equal to the fleet average value. Uh, but that's only that's only if the fair market value uh, uh, exceeds 21.2 for a passenger's auto down from 21.3 or 23.100 for a truck or van up from 22.9 in 2015. Now the next thing we're going to look at is a very interesting uh, court case uh, that I ran across uh, during December and it was Cartwright TC Memo 2015-212 and in this in this case which shows on page 6 uh, a doc, this doctor was uh, in 2008-2009 his name is Jefferson Cartwright he operated a medical practice and he also worked as an on-call physician and staff surgeon at a hospital and his home was 25 miles from the hospital and as an on-call physician and surgeon at the hospital, he was required to work a 24-hour period, three days a month, from Friday through Sunday. If he was notified in an emergency situation to report to the hospital, he was required to arrive within one hour. He has to drive pretty fast. In other certain circumstances, he was instructed to respond with, to pages within 20 minutes and stat pages within five minutes, which means he can't possibly make it from home to the hospital. So... What Cartwright did is he purchased a Rambler Navigator motorhome, drove it from his home to the hospital when he reported for on-call duty. He parked it in the hospital parking lot near its emergency room so he could rest and sleep in the Navigator when he wasn't needed inside the hospital. Because Cartwright himself suffers from very serious and chronic medical conditions, he, he, he thought the use of the Navigator would help better his, serve his patients. He reviewed the patient charts and his on his computer and referred to his medical books in the Navigator. He did not treat patients in the Navigator at all. So Hartwright remained, maintained mileage log for his business and personal use of the Navigator. Now think about it. his commuting to the hospital is not deductible and uh, his personal use is obviously not deductible. So what mileage did he have? Yeah, well he's just parked that thing at the hospital and then used it. So what the IRS did, they cut him down from his uh, his filed re returns where he used, I think it was 80 and 100%, they cut him down to about 20 and 22% uh, uh, ba based on their calculation. So it's kind of an interesting case. It, it does show that you can, you can use the motorhome as an office, but only in special circumstances and and you got to be careful of how you do the calculations. So, all right, let's take a look at the next issue, which is uh, ABLE accounts. And uh, you know, a little background on ABLE accounts that they were, they, they're named after achieving a better life experience, ABLE, uh, and they allow uh, families raising children with disabilities to save and pay for disability-related expenses through an ABLE account. They're somewhat fashioned after a, a Section 529 plan. They allow contributions up to $14,000 a year. Now, unlike 529 plans, it's $14,000 a year, period. It can't do five years' worth, so, you know, it's just, and it can't have multiple contributors. So, uh, so we're, we're limited to $14,000 a year, these accounts, and the total contributions are limited to $100,000. Uh, so, and then distributions, including earnings, are tax-free to the benef designated beneficiary if used to pay for qualified disability expenses, which include housing, education, transportation, health, prevention, and wellness. Uh, employment, training, and support is also included. Uh, so, you can, you can these, these have some benefit. And the primary purpose that the IRS put these together was that in order for a person who is disabled and on federal benefits to, 
to um, have money in a bank is limited to two thousand dollars. So they can't have any sizable amount of funds that they can uh, make get earnings on and, and help pay for their 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 um, their costs. Um, so so here so so these able accounts now. Uh, uh, have limited benefit, but but they did they did re, these proposed regulations uh, have relaxed some requirements. So, able accounts will not need to include safeguards to determine which distrib distributions are for qualified disability expenses, nor will they be required to identify distributions that will be used for housing expenses. Now, this is the plan, not the individual. So, if the individual gets audited, I think they would have a problem, but. But the plan itself does not have to do that. So, you now the next one is the ABLE programs will not need to request a taxpayer identification number of contributors to an ABLE account at the time the contribution is made, provided that the program has a system in place to reject contributions exceeding the annual limits, which are currently 14000 However, if an excess contribution is made into an ABLE account, the program will need to request the contributors uh, tax identification number. A designated, designated beneficiaries can open an ABLE account by certifying under penalties of perjury that they meet the qualification standards including the receipt of a signed physician's diagnosis and two, they, they will retain that diagnosis and provide it to the program or the IRS upon request. So the program itself does not have to request this diagnosis. The the beneficiary can just certify themselves that they are that, but they better have it so in case it gets gets requested. Okay, now we're going to move on to page uh, EA renewals. Now this is a good reminder. I've every year we have uh, EAs call up and say, "Oops, I forgot. What do I do now?" And they go through this this drawn out procedure with RPO to get their EA reestablished. So it's better to do it right and get it done right up front. So. EA renewals are, are up for those with Social Security numbers entering in 0, 1, 2, and 3. You go to www.gov.pay and you'll start, see a spot there to click on the 8554. Complete that, pay your fee, uh, and uh, I think it's $30 this year. And uh, you can pay with a credit card or a debit card. And uh, you need to get that done before. Uh, March 31st, that's when the old one expires, but I would get it done a, a lot sooner than that so you can get your enrollment card back, okay? So in the instructions on page 8, there's actually a, a line-by-line uh, instructions on how to do renew. So uh, follow that through and you can uh, get your renewal done. Okay, also P10 renewals are up, so don't forget to do that. That, that Your P10s expire by December 31st, 2015, and everyone has to have that done. And the PTN registration fee this year is 50 bucks. So uh, uh, make sure you go to irs.gov and, and, and just put in the search box P10 and, and you'll take you to where you can uh, do their registration. Uh, and as, a, as a note too, um, the P10 account does include uh, a listing of all the education you've taken for the year. So you can you get a summary there. Uh, CPAs uh, do not have to put their P10s in when they get CPE credits, and uh, so maybe all theirs won't be there. But if, as a habit, they always do that, then then they can always see in their P10 in their, their P10 account their CPA. Little caution here for CTEC registered repairs: uh, you were supposed to have renewed by October 31st, and after that, you're a late registrant. Uh, however, if that late registration continues past uh, January 15th, you got some bad things happen to you. Your CTEC registration expires and then you'll have to start out as a brand new person and take the 60 hour qualifying education course and, uh, and, and, and renew and renew that way. And that's, that's, that will delay your registration, which will preclude you probably from doing tax returns for, uh, early part of the year until you get the other rest of it caught up. Uh, the, uh, Renewal fee and it's thirty-three dollars, and a late fee is fifty-five for a total of eighty-eight dollars. But be sure you get it done by January fifteenth. And one more thing for uh, CTEC registered preparers: um, 
in order to represent your clients in 2016 and afterwards you're going to have to have a, uh, a record of completion from the IRS. You're exempt from all the requirements uh, the IRS has for voluntary preparation and uh, so only those people that meet the voluntary prepare rules can, can represent clients after 2016 in office audit. So I would strongly suggest that you make sure that you go on your P10 account. The IRS, once, once, once CTAC uploads everybody who is registered with California to the IRS, the IRS will put out an email to all those people telling them to go back on their P10 account and check the box that says that they will abide by Circular 230 subpart B if you do that, then you'll get a record of completion and you will, you will be able to represent, continue to represent your clients. Okay, let's go to, to the next issue. Oh, I, just, I didn't move the things. Here we go. Okay, so IRS extends the home assistance payment treatments. Um, so in notice 2015-77, the IRS had extended through 2017 the earlier guidance on the tax consequences of programs that provide payments made to or on behalf of financially distressed homeowners. The guidance includes safe harbor methods for computing a homeowner's deduction for, for payments made on a home mortgage. The notice also extends penalty relief related to information reporting for mortgages, servicers, and for state housing finance agencies. So, Homeowners payments received under the following programs are in the nature of general welfare. And under that, that condition, they aren't included in the recipient's income. So mortgage assistance payments made through the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, under Section 325 of the National Housing Act. Uh, the taxpayer doesn't get an, an interest deduction. The regs bar any interest deduction with respect to a taxpayer's indebtedness to the extent of assistance payments made by HUD under Section 235. Payments made on behalf of homeowners in the Department of Treasury and Department of Housing and Urban Development Home Affordable Modification Program, HAMP, to the mortgage holder where the borrower is eligible for principal reduction for the outstanding balance of qualifying mortgage payment to the HAMP's principal reduction alternative uh, program. The information on debt relief under HAMP uh, is, is covered under under uh, under cancellation of debt in the Big Book of Taxes in Chapter 209, uh, but we're not covering cancellation of debt here. Only the only the interest, uh, how to handle the interest on mortgage payments. So then, number three, payments made on to or on behalf of homeowner under the State Housing Financing Agency programs listed under Notice 2011-14 and updated with the www.treasury.gov.hhf uh, website with funds allocated from the, from the Housing Finance Agency's Hardest Hit Fund for tax years 2000-2017. Uh, it, it did terminate in 2015 prior to the notice. The Safe Harbor Interest Deduction for those taxpayers who receive these payments is the lesser of the actual amount paid during a year to the mortgage servicer, HUD, or state HFA on the, mortgage, on the home mortgage, or the sum of the amounts on the Form 1098 is interest, real property tax, and for 2010 through 2014 only, unless extended by Congress, deductible mortgage insurance premiums. Uh, that's one of the issues, of whether, whether deductible mortgage insurance premiums are still allowed. Those are premiums after 2009. Uh, but that, that expired in two, after 2014, so we're waiting to see if they can include an extender bill. Uh, we won't know for probably a week or so. Okay, this safe harbor, safe harbor rule applies for a tax year if the homeowner, A, meets the requirements of Code Section 163 and Code 164 to deduct all, all the home mortgage interest on the loan and all the real property tax in the principal residence. A and B participates in the in the EHLP or SSSP or state program described in the appendix of the notice 2011-14. So basically that's saying, you know, you, you they have to actually be qualified to deduct interest in tax. It has to be their primary residence. They have to be the owner uh, 
That's what that's saying. Okay. Okay, information reporting. The IRS Form 1098-MA is used by the various government agencies to report payments by state housing finance agencies and, or the Department of Housing and Urban Development. The following are the box, box descriptions for that form. Box 1 shows a total amount of the state HFA or HUD mortgage assistance payments and homeowner mortgage payments. Box 2 shows the amount of the state HFA slash HUD mortgage assistance payments and box 3 shows the amount of the homeowner mortgage payments. And the IRS will not assert penalties against section uh, 6721 and code section 6722 against any state uh, agency for failing to file or furnish form 1098 for calendar years 2011 through 2017 if the state agency that provides each homeowner and the IRS with a statement setting forth the homeowner's name, taxpayer identification number, and the amount of payments the, the state agency made to the mortgage servicer under the state program. Okay, so now let's go to the next issue here, which is proposed modified residence rules for U.S. territories. Now remember, these were proposed, so just bring you up to just keep you in, in the loop here. So, first of all, uh, let's turn to page, starts on page 9, but turn to page 10, and, and uh, it tells you when a U.S. citizen or resident alien is a bona fide resident of a particular U.S. territory, and, and then what, what tests they have to, 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 to uh, pass to do that. So, uh, they have to pass the, pre the presence test, the tax home test, and the closer connection test. Excuse me, they have to test any one of those following tests. So the presence test requires that the individual satisfy one of the following tests. It may be present in the relevant U.S. territory for at least 183 days during a tax year. It's called the 183-day rule. Or present in the U.S. territory for at least 549 days during a three-year period consisting of the current year and the two immediately preceding years, and providing the individual is present in U.S. territory for at least 60 days during each year of that period. Or, three, is not present in the U.S. for more than 90 days during a tax year. Or, four, does not have more than $3,000 of earned income from the U.S. sources and is present in the relevant U.S. territory for more than more days than in the U.S. during a tax year, or has a sig no significant connection to the U.S. during a tax year. Okay, so that tells you how they qualify for the presence test, and they also have to meet the tax home test and the closer connection test in order to qualify. So, the existing regulations state that an individual is considered to be present in the relevant pos possession of uh, on any day that the individual is physically present in that possession at any time during the day. So in other words, any in one hour or one minute counts, counts as a day. However, the regulations also provide that certain days count as days of presence in the relevant U.S. territory for purposes of the presence test, even if the individual is not physically present in that territory. For example, if uh, such constructive U.S. presence is, is offered to an individual who is receiving or accompanying uh, a certain family member receiving qualifying medical treatment outside of the relevant territory or is unable to return to the relevant, relevant possession during the presidential declared disaster or a mandatory evacuation order. Um, so anyway, uh, the new, the new, what the new regulations do is they, they let you add on some time here for the presence test can be revisited, made more flexible. Uh, so under the proposed regulations, an individual would be considered to be present in the relevant U.S. territory for up to 30 days during which the individual is outside both the U.S. and the relevant territory. That's called the 30-day consecutive, uh, excuse me, constructive presence rule. However, the 30-day constructive presence rule would not apply if the number of days that the individual is considered to be present in the U.S. during the tax year equals or exceeds the number of days that the individual is considered to be present in the relevant U.S. territory during the tax year. 
and that's determined without taking into account any days for which the individual would be treated as present in the U.S. territory under that rule. Okay, so anyway, the, I, I'm not sure how many of you have people in, uh, that are bona fide residents of, uh, of uh, U.S. territories. Uh, I had one once and had a big, big hassle with the Franchise Tax Board and finally won, so that made me happy. Anyway, let's go now to page 11. Well, before we do that, we have polling question number two. So write this down. The answer to polling question number two is England. Okay, you got that? Here we go. Okay, so now, as, as you know, um, there's been a systemic problem with people, with, with crooks, filing phony tax returns. And the way they do this is they, they go out and they acquire um, stolen uh, Social Security numbers, of a filer and a spouse, unrelated, that people don't even know each other. They go get an employer identification number. They make up a phony W-2. E-filing system uh, pops open for, for filing the first day or the first day or two. They file a joint return for those for that couple who don't know each other and uh, have, it, have it deposited in their bank account and they're gone with the money before the IRS even knows what happens. And then the people whose Social Security numbers they use can't even, can't even file themselves because their Social Security numbers have been used, and they can't get a copy of return because they don't know what the other Social Security number is. So this is a systemic problem that's been going on for quite some time. There was, there was one lady in, uh, in Florida that uh, got away with like $30 million, and the only way they caught her was she was flaunting the IRS on the, on the Internet. Uh, That'll teach her, huh? Anyway, okay, so what they're doing, they're going to do, a, a, they're testing a W-2 verification code, uh, which they've gotten some employers, I guess, to, to volunteer to participate with. So for the filing season 2016, that'll be 2015 returns, uh, they, they have set this up. So the objective is to verify the W-2 submitted by taxpayers on e-filed individual tax returns, the IRS has partnered with certain payroll service providers to include a 16-digit code, a new verification code field on a limited number of Form W-2 copies provided to employees. Now, should you run across one of those W-2s, the code will be displayed in four, four groups of four alpha, alphanumeric characters separated by hyphens. Uh, so now that verification will appear on the same versions of the payroll firms, Form W-2, B and C. A separate labeled copy B is to be filed with, with the employer's tax return and C is to be the employee's record. So the B and C is gonna have these numbers. So, so the, the, here, here's what's gonna happen. They're going to, you're gonna put that verification code in if you happen to get a hold of one of these and then, then the IRS will be able to check and see if that is a valid W-2 because the uh, person stealing the person's ID won't, won't, and making up a phony W-2 won't have that verification number. So that's one way of, of, of trying to circumvent this problem. So anyway, keep your eyes out for that and, uh, and, uh, and uh, make sure you get those numbers all in there right. And by the, by the way, the IRS has said that they will not reject any returns this year based on the number being wrong. Uh, but but even so, you should be careful on how you input it. That's alphanumeric 16 characters. It's easy to make a mistake. So, okay, let's go to the next issue here. Is my I, my RA funding options now? About two years ago, uh, the president came out with uh, uh, what he what he termed my RA accounts. It's like a starter count for people who don't have retirement plans, and they can put small amounts of money in there. Uh, and, and the whole idea was to, to let them, you know, fund, fund these through the government, and, uh, uh, and and the government will be the administrator, and they can put, you know, minimal amounts in. But once once they hit uh, 15000 or they get to 30 years, then they have to convert those into uh, conventional uh, Roth IRAs. 
And the, these are Roth IRAs, they get no deduction for them. Now, in order to participate, the employer had to voluntarily say that they would, they would do a direct deposit for them. And the employee, it's voluntary for an employee too. I guess it, I guess it turned out that there was so many employers that just didn't want to bother with this that now the now the IRS has come out with some additional ways that they can actually fund these plans, and that means that they can, uh, if you'll turn to page uh, twelve, they can f go from uh, uh, checking or savings accounts. They can make a make a one time or or, or recurring payments into the, their own IRA. My IRA. <laughs> my RA account uh, or if they get a refund uh, on their federal tax return they can direct that to their uh, or some portion of that refund to their my RA account so something to watch for and um, you know uh, okay now let's go to the next issue which is um, the chief counsel came out with some advice on the, on when an an, a, uh, an employee employer has an insurance plan that the spouse can participate in, and and the question the question arose with this was, uh, is that can that be uh, pre tax? And the chief counsel came out in his advice, and it's shown there in the. I get a little typo in the in the PowerPoint. It should be 2015, uh, 47006. Uh, but that's the correct numbers in the, the handout material. Uh, he said, "Yeah, it can be. It, it doesn't have to appear as income to the to the uh, employee, provided it's it's post tax payments." But it cannot be. Doesn't qualify for the salary reduction plans reduction of income so uh, that's in case that comes up you'll know the answer to that so okay let's look at the transportation bill next oh whoops we got the state daycare care things I forgot about hold on so on page 12 and we're still on page 12 uh, the state daycare payments are subject to levy the, the reason this the chief counsel decided that was that normally state daycare payments paid directly to the to the individual could not be limited because they'd be, uh, 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 what's what I'm looking for, they'd be uh, welfare type payments. But when, when they're paid directly to the caregiver, the care provider, uh, not paid the individual, then they are, then they can be levied. So that was uh, uh, the chief counsel's uh, advice on that. Now let's look at the transportation bill. Um, you would think the transportation bill would have to do with our highways and roads, but um, they sneak a few things in all these bills, and this one had, had three issues that, have, that apply to income taxes. So um, the first one is that they can uh, deny or revoke uh, passports for delinquent taxpayers. And they would do that in, in the in the in the in the law that was passed, they actually said it had to be seriously delinquent tax debt, and that none of the exceptions apply. And so, a seriously delinquent tax debt was one that exceeds fifty thousand uh, dollars, but but the exception of that that is uh, a seriously delinquent tax debt is not one where an agreement is is in place to repay the debt under an installment agreement, or where a collection is suspended because of cancellation of debt. Uh, a due process hearing under code section 6330 or because of innocent spouse relief applies under code section 6015B or C or where a taxpayer is no longer married and separate under relief is requested or pending under code section 6015F. Now the interesting part here that the um, State Department administers passports not the IRS which means that the uh, IRS is going to have to pass certain tax return information off to the uh, to the State Department. Let's see what they do with that, huh? That's bound to raise some hackles. 
All right, now let's, next, the last polling question for the day is Indian. So write that down, Indian. Give you a second to do that. Oh, and before, before, we, and before I finish up, then it's still on page 12, uh, and part of the transportation bill, uh, the rules mandating the IRS use of private debt collectors, uh, and this is interesting, it said the new code section provides that the IRS shall establish qualified debt collection contracts for the collection of outstanding inactive tap, tax receivables. An inactive tax receivable is determined as outstanding ass assessments included in the IRS collectible inventory if, at any time after assessment, the IRS removes the receivables from the active inventory for lack of resources or inability to locate the taxpayer. Uh, lack of resources is probably going to be frequently encountered since their budget's been cut so badly. Or or more than one-third of the period of the application statute of limitations has elapsed and the receivable hasn't been assigned for collections to any IRS employee or if for receivables that have been assigned to collection over 365 days have passed without interaction with the taxpayer or a third party for purposes of furthering its collection. So, uh, but it's interesting that that the use of private debt collectors was a hot button a few years back, and even the taxpayer advocate came out against them. So, um, I, I guess the IRS doesn't. I guess Congress doesn't care. They're just going to go after those those debts. Okay, and then um, also Form Series fifty five hundred automatic extension has been reduced. Uh, it was uh, three and a half months, uh, and now under, under the Transportation Act, extension has been re reduced back to its original two and a half months. It was three and a half uh, on temporary measure. Now they're reducing it back. So, okay. Well, I think that probably concludes our uh, our session for today. Um, uh, thank you for joining me, and uh, to complete your uh, polling test and print your CPA certificates, you need to go back to our, uh, our recent, tab, recent achievements tabs within uh, our, our, our uh, website. Your certificate can also be found on your main account and achievements folder. So well, I look forward to seeing you in January when we do the January update. Take care and have a good day, and, and, and a good holiday. Take care. Bye.